Good morning. I'm Derek Milo, MAC Communications Director and your host for this Camp County's webinar, Basic Steps for Counties to Enhance Election Cybersecurity. Joining us today is Rita Reynolds of the National Association of Counties. She is Chief Technology Officer for NACO, and in this capacity, she oversees the internal technology operations of NACO and leads NACO's technology programs and initiatives for counties. Before Rita gets started, I do want to offer a couple of quick notes. First, we will take questions at the end, so please be writing your questions into the question field of your GoToWebinar toolbox. Second, the video and slide deck from today's event will be available on the Camp Counties page at micounties.org later today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rita. All right, good morning, everyone. And Derek, thank you so much for having me today. It's a privilege to be presenting to all of you. I just wanna um, spend a little bit of time talking to you a little bit about myself. Uh, it's always good to, to share a little bit about the, the speaker's background. And then we're gonna dive into uh, cybersecurity, of course, and the trends with COVID. Uh, but I really wanna spend a bit of time on practical tips and talking about .gov. And overall, we'll focus on how this you can work towards securing your elections even better in the current environment that we're in. So a little bit about me. I, have, I was with the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania for over 20 years and served as the CIO there, uh, doing very similar work to what I do now at NACO. And uh, jumping to the National Association of Counties last July, just a little over a year ago, I proceeded to carry out the same type of, of work that I was doing at CCAP. I worked on a technology blueprint to help position uh, the uh, NACO in a better light uh, in terms of uh, supporting IT directors and county CIOs and, and having a direction into the near future and, and longer. Uh, also, you know, handle internal technology improvements, but really uh, spending a lot of time with getting to know all of you as county IT directors, CIOs, and, and other county staff. Uh, I always like to share a couple things about myself. I am a, a runner. I, I can do nine, 10 miles pretty easily. I enjoy doing that and I can't eat chicken. It's not that I won't eat chicken, it's that I can't. Uh, it's kind of a, an odd, uh, uh, wouldn't call it an allergy, but uh, anyway, just something for you to, to know about me. So I want to start with going back to the year 2000. That's been over 20 years ago and my typical day uh, was quite different than it is now. I still wake up at the same time, and in, if it wasn't COVID, I'd probably be driving to a conference or a meeting. I've been doing that for years, stopping around lunchtime to have lunch, and then uh, making sure I get my workout in, in the evening. Some of that's the same. But what's really interesting is to look at what technology we had back in the year 2000. No YouTube existed, no Facebook existed. Smartphone, I remember what's called a bag phone. And the uh, Nokia had come out with something of a cell phone right around the year 2000. But we didn't have Twitter. Uh, how we got our news was pretty much still the newspaper, the paper copy that we would get thrown on the front doorstep. We didn't have Google Maps on our phone. Uh, we had some websites, and if you have an opportunity, go to Google, type in Wayback Machine, click on that link, and put in your county website. And you can see when your county created a website, what it looked like, and there'll be periodic screenshots from, oh, 1995 up until the present. The other thing we didn't have in 2000 was Wi-Fi. I can't imagine going back to that time. It is incredibly different than what we have today. And even with the technology tools itself, when it comes to our applications, we were still on Windows XP. Uh, the version of Office was 2000. Uh, PBX phone systems were at the, the height of utilization. We were starting to get some smartphones, as I said, the one that, that came out first was the BlackBerry. Totally different than today. So what does it look like today? We have smart everything. 
smart cars, smart sound systems, smart watches. I've got my Apple watch on. Uh, when I don't have it on, I feel like I'm missing a piece of my body. Uh, and, and we joke about the smart cloud. There's so, so much connectivity today that just the capabilities were just not there in the year 2000. So as you can imagine, cyber has changed greatly and it's in the headlines. I, I had quite a number of articles in terms of cyber and ransomware in general in a previous presentation, but I took that out because as IT directors and CIOs, I know you all see that those articles on a pretty regular basis. And I wanted to focus on elections today. So as I looked over the articles and what's happened in the past few months, the one that stood out to me is what um, Iowa did just a couple months back. Uh, it was right after the, um, the situation with uh, the uh, voting app, or should be the, um, the, the mobile app that had a ton of issues with election day. And Iowa Secretary of State said, we're gonna put a million dollars right towards election cybersecurity. And we're gonna focus on scanning all of the county websites and internal systems to identify vulnerabilities. Uh, really fascinating article. If you have time um, and go can Google it or you know, Bing it, take a look at it and read through it. Very progressive in terms of where are our vulnerabilities. And as we know, when it comes to election night voting, every county is posting results up on their website. The last thing you want is for your website to go down. Now, unofficial um, results, but still that's where your citizens go to. So beyond that, what challenges are we dealing with today? And I have audience interaction here because I've used this slide a couple times. And if you could just take a moment or two to uh, type in your chat box um, or the, excuse me, the Q&A box there and, and share with me uh, what type of challenges you're dealing with. I'm of course gonna talk to them and I really would like to see what you have to say. I'm and looking and and don't be don't be bashful. Um, I know we all are dealing with challenges. Uh, COVID threw us for a loop, and we went from traveling to uh, all of a sudden having to work from our homes and not being able to go out or going out on a very limited basis. All right, I don't see anyone and uh, typing any questions or comments in there, but that's okay because. I'm gonna share with you what, what I've gotten from other CIOs and IT directors. Uh, first of all, as we all know, our greatest exposure are our end users. If, you know, if we didn't have people in the equation, it would be a little bit easier to deal with cyber, but the reality is that our role is made up of people. And all of us have different capabilities, different understandings, and given how prolific the the emails that are coming through are and how good those fake emails are, sometimes it's really hard to tell, should I click on this link or not? So our end users in the end are our greatest exposure. So in terms of COVID-19 itself, keeping in mind that it's our end users that we really have to keep an eye on and, and work with and help educate, COVID-19 brought about a number of changes. Telework being the, the the highest on the list. And this list I'm going to go through really came from surveying and talking to county CIOs and IT directors that are on the NACO Tech Exchange. Uh, telework was the very first thing that they had to address. They, uh, those that I work, talked to and worked with said over and over again, we allowed some telework or work from home, but not much. And now everybody needs to be able to telework. As a result of that, Remote support has become critical. Finding the right tools and using them securely to support that, that remote workforce. Which means if you still have applications that are run on your network, VPN has to be in place. Which then leads to a higher degree of connectivity. And as we know, many of our employees live in rural areas. Uh, the connectivity and broadband access may not be the best. Wrapping around all of that is the security. And what I heard from a number of counties, counties is that they renewed their phishing tests and education. 
Uh, they recognized that the bad actors were capitalizing on COVID-19 information and really mirroring those type of emails. So uh, a lot of education has been going on with, with the county staff. But of course, uh, Derek and I were just talking about this before the webinar started today the significant rise in virtual team meetings and public meetings uh, using those online tools, whether it's Microsoft Teams or GoToWebinar or Zoom, Facebook Live, all of a sudden those tools became front and center. And I have yet to talk to a county that hasn't implemented one of those tools. So those are the trends that need proper security applied. <clears throat> Now, specifically to elections, and this really has become um, a very front and center conversation in the April, May, June timeframe, but you have election officials, not elected, well, they are elected, but not your commissioners necessarily that I'm talking about right now, but your election directors, they're now working from home. Uh, they need, in, normal, in a normal election, they would be in the office or in a particular location. Now they're having to participate by video. Connectivity is still is a challenge, absolutely. Uh, increase in mail-in ballots, another conversation that Derek and I were having right before the webinar started today. Tremendous increase in the percentage of ballots that are being mailed in as opposed to going into the uh, voting precinct or location. And with that in mind, because of the social distancing, there's a limitation now on available voting locations, as well as your volunteers. Many uh, counties are dealing with an older population that have served as volunteers in the election on the election day. And because of COVID, they do not wanna be around people, perfectly understandable. So you're having to find new locations as well as new volunteers. Significant challenges that do have a technology impact. So I like to say that in the midst of every crisis lies a great opportunity. Actually, there's debate about who said this first, but uh, Albert Einstein is, is one of the, the uh, authors that I come across quite often. And even in the crisis that we're dealing with with COVID-19, there is opportunity. And one thing I heard from county IT directors and CIOs is that staff are adapting. It's, it's really quite an, uh, um, interesting observation of human behavior where something an individual wouldn't have tried eight months ago or six months ago, now that you have to, you can do it. And a second um, lesson that's been learned is that staff equipment needs to be more mobile. Still quite a few counties that uh, employees had a desktop and nothing else because they worked in the office. They had no reason to uh, have a laptop or surface but we are seeing that it makes a whole lot more sense for everyone to have a more mobile desktop, as I said, laptop or a Surface or a notebook, something along those lines. And then broadband is still a major issue. Uh, in that process of trying to address broadband, some counties have been more successful with uh, looking at FirstNet and how it's being utilized in their county and where they can expand um, using FirstNet for what we would call tangential, tangential emergency type departments. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the, the county survey, uh, opportunities uh, just to summarize here and elaborate a little bit more, uh, virtual public meetings. I am hearing over and over from CIOs that elected officials are saying, we're gonna to continue to do virtual public meetings. Even when things are back to a new normal or a near normal, we still want this capability. And it's an opportunity that I'm excited to hear about because it does uh, broaden the scope and the range of information out to your citizens in terms of what's happening at the county level. But with that, our considerations around security and open records, public comments uh, that uh, need to be typed into a chat or shared uh, verbally, and uh, sharing tips and best practices and training. All of those are key to successful virtual public meetings. Uh, collaboration tools uh, have become a huge part of the county uh, framework now. 
uh, Microsoft Teams utilization for so many organizations have and counties have jumped 400 and 500 uh, percent. There's a nice statistics area in the administrative side of Microsoft Teams that can show you the growth over, over a three-month period. And then, as I mentioned on the prior slide, eliminating desktops. I can't tell you how many times I've heard counties say, we're not buying desktops anymore. We are focused on replacing any desktops coming up for replacement with a Surface, with a laptop, uh, something that's more mobile because the situation we're in could happen again uh, even in the near future, of course, but even in a couple years and counties want to be prepared. So on the innovation side specific to elections, let me just share a few things. I uh, talked to a number of counties and in several, they've been able to deliver effective translation through their, their interpreters by using virtual interpreters on election day. They've used Microsoft Teams. They've set those interpreters up on what they call uh, 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 older versions of iPhones that are only Wi-Fi enabled. So the iPhone is in each uh, voting uh, location. And if someone needs a translator, they're there on demand <clears throat> so that they don't need as many interpreters or translators at the polling locations and they're maximizing the social distancing requirements. And it, it has filled a gap for many uh, in that respect. So something to think about that you could easily implement um, with, with your elections as they, they, either the primary you may still have or the fall election. And then video streaming. Uh, as I said, all of you are using video streaming in some fashion, uh, whether it's the Microsoft Teams or the Zoom, which are the two main ones I'm hearing. Uh, it is very applicable in the election environment. So some locations, depending on what your mandates are with media and candidate representatives, you can use live video streaming so that they can still participate and observe what's happening in the voting locations, but they don't have to be on site. And uh, that extends as well to when you're canvassing absentee ballots and there's mail-in ballots, concerned citizens, the media, your candidate representatives want to see how that's being handled. And as we've seen in recent days, there have come into question uh, whether mail-in ballots are being counted um, timely and properly. So this is a critical tool in your toolbox that you can implement for, for election day. And of course, allowing the public to view the results of the collection process. I was talking to one IT director and he said, you know, we set up the cameras and we turned on Facebook Live and walked away, got some coffee. Uh, there's not a whole lot of activity to watch, but we're doing our effort, doing our best efforts so that we can be transparent. Now, keeping all of that in mind, uh, think about a couple other options there of what you can use video streaming for. Uh, in some counties, how they are transferring their electronic ballots is through a USB, depending on the voting equipment. So having video streaming set, set up so that that can be monitored and recorded to demonstrate what I call, the, what I personally call the chain of custody, uh, it's very helpful with video streaming. And then, in those areas where paper ballots are still being used uh, and watching how they're being processed, here are a couple of slides to show our, of live streaming that took place on election day. That helps with the transparency with uh, your citizens. And it's very important to, to think about that, but at the same time, make sure you have the proper security in place. And I'm gonna talk about all of that um, after the break. So let me stop and uh, Derek, do you wanna um, take a few moments? And I know you have a couple uh, videos you'd like to show. Yes, uh, thank you, Rita. We're just gonna take a brief break here for a couple of messages from our sponsors of the uh, Camp Counties webinars. Hello and welcome to everyone attending the Michigan Association of County Summer webinar here today. My name is Emma Cook. I am with Enbridge Energy and I'm a community engagement analyst based here in beautiful Mackinac City. And I just want to start off today by saying thank you to all of you who work so hard every day to address the issues and concerns of our Michigan communities. My name is Candace Reddick, and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Advisor. 
Here at Enbridge, we value our partnership with county government across the state and across every mile of our pipeline system. That partnership makes it possible to All right, one more quick message from Blue Cross Blue Shield. All right, Rita, I will turn it back over to you for the rest of the presentation. Great. All right, give me one second here and I will pull back up our PowerPoint and we will start where we left off. All right, every, can you see that, Derek? Are we good? We are good. So what I wanna do now is just share some practical tips with all of you uh, for addressing cyber. Some of them, uh, of course, may seem very basic, but others I would venture to say uh, some have not thought of. So regardless if you're looking at how to bolster your election security or just general security, it's very important that you have standalone policies. I, I did a little bit of research before this presentation specific to elections, and I saw this over and over again. Acceptable use and a sign-off. Typically what I've found over the years is that there's technology a policy in the employee handbook, but there's not a separate acceptable use policy specific to technology with a sign off. And what I mean by that is that each year you do an annual review and employees sign a one pager saying they acknowledge what's in the acceptable use policy. IT confidentiality is critical. Think of it uh, with your IT department or your IT staff that we see a whole lot more 
than most county employees do when it comes to confidential and private information. And so we need to be held to a higher standard. And having a separate IT confidentiality policy with a similar sign off is critical, protects both the county and the employee. Uh, of course, a privacy policy, and then a what I call mobile device management policy or cell phone policy, something along those lines that states what is acceptable when it comes to county owned devices or county sponsored devices where you're you have a personal device, but maybe you're getting county email on that that mobile device. Policies are what I call the devil in the details. And once you have it written, you need to just revisit it once a year, make sure it's still in good standing. <clears throat> now here's a nice long list uh, that are really basics these days. They used to be, well, we'll get to it, or that's on the roadmap for a couple years from now. I, I don't hear that anymore. So let me just run through those with you. Multi-factor authentication. With uh, Office 365, it's very easy to Im implement these days. The uh, Office 365 uh, package of software or suite comes with MFA built into it. Uh, if you have other types of uh, uh, suite products, as I call them, you need to ask the question, can we do MFA? You know, think of it on your personal level with banking. We do that now. We log into a computer, it sends you a pin on the phone. Almost any application that I use now in the cloud has that capability. And with us being remote, that is so critical. Second item is email banner on your email. If you don't have this, you need to get it in place sooner than later. And it, what it is is an email banner that says, this is an external email. Please be careful of uh, links and attachments. Where this is really helpful is if you have internal staff that looks like they're sending you an email and asking you to transfer money or go out and buy gift cards. If it says external email across the top, you know it's a fake email. And that's educating your end users to look for that. So the email banner becomes a really nice visual uh, to help alert staff to those fake emails. Another area that I do see is pretty common, and uh, just a reminder, make sure that you're, you're not allowing local administrative rights on your county uh, employee devices, the desktops or laptops. In IT, if you're, you need admin rights, but what we do, and a lot of counties do, is that IT staff have a regular login and then they have a tech admin login. And if they need to do work on a particular server or a computer, they have to log in with that tech admin account. Automatic updates is a given. Uh, making sure that you are monitoring that staff aren't trying to bypass running the automatic updates is so critical when you think about what we're dealing with in this day and age with what we call zero day um, viruses that are out there. By having automatic updates on, it lessens the chance of those local machines being in infected. I'm not gonna say it eliminates it, but it will lessen it. Here's one that you might not have uh, thought of or uh, thought was even possible. There are free tools out there now from uh, reliable vendors that you can run on your environment of your user accounts, whether it's Exchange or whatever platform you might be using, and you can run a password audit. You yourself are not gonna see their passwords, you're not gonna jeopardize that security, but what it's going to do is give you information about the passwords your end users are using. And things like, uh, are there any users who their password has expired in a year or two years? You might be sitting there saying, well, we have a group policy. They can't do that. I know from experience that exceptions happen. And sometimes staff, IT staff might click that little box that says never expire. And you do it for a reason, but you don't come back and uncheck that box. So the password audit will flag those for you. It will also tell you if end user passwords are common throughout the county. In other words, 
They might be using password one, two, three, four, and that will give you that information. And there are also other uh, examples of passwords that are known to be on the dark web and are being sold. So really well, great wealth of information if you can run a password audit tool on your environment. Also um, encouraging the use of secure and approved cloud services. Here specifically, I hear uh, employees will go out and they'll put things out on Dropbox or Google Drive and they may not be near as secure as what your approved options are. So making sure that if you have policy in place, you have a way to monitor that or even prevent employees from using those unauthorized or unapproved cloud options. Now here are a couple that have to do with your employees from working from home. Ask them, are you using a password on your router? First of all, they should be, but sometimes they're not and making sure it's not the default uh, admin password, for example. Encouraging them to uh, make uh, not try to bypass any type of backups that you have in place, um, if that's possible, but reminding them that mandatory backups are critical and that if uh, they you know, save a file to say their C drive, it may not get backed up. And then in this day and age, we've used USB drives or USB sticks quite prevalently, we don't really need them as much anymore because of the mobility and the um, access to cloud storage. Uh, so discouraging the use of USB sticks is another best practice these days. All right, uh, let's just talk a little bit more about your employees, uh, keeping in mind that I know, depending on the county, background checks are required for all employees and sometimes just for certain departments. And I am seeing more and more that the background checks are required by all departments, but especially in IT. You need to make sure that, that there aren't exceptions there. Uh, occasionally, I might hear of one, uh, you know, something that happened 20, 30 years ago, uh, but just making sure you're reviewing that with your HR and that they're aware. And this is really important when it become, comes to things like CJIS or criminal justice information sharing. And of course, with the elections process, the last thing anyone wants on the front page is a breach of some sort and a county employee um, maybe didn't pass a background check. And then access control process. So what this means um, is that when an employee comes in, you grant them access to certain applications and that usually comes from a nice form or a nice list from the department. But when they leave, do you find out the employee's gone on the day they leave? I have heard over and over from IT directors and CIOs that that's a tough one for us to, to stay on top of. We, you know, we have policy in place that we're to be notified so we can cut off access immediately. We generally will get those, but if somebody moves from one department to another, we might not know. And so they keep the access to some applications that they shouldn't have access to now that they're in a different role or a different department. So keeping that in mind. And uh, contracts used to be fairly easy. Here's a contract coming in that you need to look at and you have the attorney look at and your procurement office look at and sign off on and you're good to go. Fast forward to 2020, and now you as a CIO or IT director really need to stay on top of uh, certain uh, clauses that need to be in those contracts. And so encouraging all the departments that if there's a technology related contract that you need to see it and review it, and that you're looking for, first and foremost, what are the requirements for incident notification? If this is a third party provider, for a department, say a case management system to your probation office. What's the requirements if they're, if that third party is breached or has an incident? Do they have a time frame to notify the county department? Because ultimately it's the county that's responsible, no matter where it happened, if it's out in the cloud and it's through a third party vendor, you still are required to do the notifications. And so you need to know sooner than later. 
And in some states, there's specific time frames you have to follow. And at the federal level, there's certain time frames everybody has to follow, especially when it comes to things like HIPAA. Uh, also looking for what I call um, a SOC type two audit. And that's a um, very uh, common practice with your large providers and large vendors. And they should not hesitate to provide you with that uh, audit report. Uh, they may ask you to sign an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement, but you need to take a look at it and make sure that they have passed uh, muster when it comes to security. And uh, then background checks again, and of course, physical security. Have you asked the provider of the application if it's going to be hosted in the cloud? Where do you host that? Uh, I hear Amazon Cloud, but sometimes I hear, well, it's a server in my garage. And hopefully that's getting few and further between, but you still need to ask the question. Now, specific to elections, here are some uh, practical tips from a security perspective. I mentioned before I was gonna uh, cover this. So if election staff are gonna be remote, making sure they're utilizing the virtual private network and making sure that they're connecting using a county issued device. There have been a few instances of where, oh, I can't get connected, so I'm going to hop on my personal computer to do this county work. Discourage that. Uh, don't allow it. Make sure there's a backup process in place so that the election staff can do their, their work from a county-owned device. And then if you are going to use the virtual meeting tools, Zoom and Microsoft Teams included, making sure that there are strong security settings in place. That means a business or government edition of those, those tools. Uh, there are free versions of Zoom, free versions of Microsoft Teams, and you really need to stay away from those. Also, uh, we have on our tech exchange, which I'll talk about here briefly uh, in a few minutes, but uh, we have best practices and a document that covers some of these security settings. Uh, so if you're part of the tech exchange, you can log in and, and download that document. And again, I'll cover that in just a few minutes. So a couple other tips about election security. If that location has changed, and I've heard from so many county IT directors and CIOs that, yeah, they told us we didn't have to have as many locations, but we still have to have the same level of security. So now we're trying to find a replacement for the nursing home location or the school location. That's great. You may find it, but you need to test where you need connectivity, make sure that you do the proper testing with a mobile MiFi or whatever connection you're able to access in that location and that it's reliable and that it is secure. And just use your list of security measures that you use for your county Wi-Fi and compare. And then if you are using those mobile device devices, uh, procuring mobile um, MDM, mobile device management software for those. It is a little bit of a cost, uh, but then you can containerize what goes on that mobile device. And if it disappears or is stolen, you're able to wipe it. And keeping those mobile devices in what I call a non-cellular uh, environment, use them to connect to the Wi-Fi only. All right, so we're gonna change uh, direction here and I wanna be sure uh, Derek had asked me to cover .gov. So let me spend a, a few moments about .gov. We all have domain names, uh, naco.org, uh, greencountypa.gov, uh, uh, adamscountypa.us, as you can tell I'm from, from Pennsylvania. So that dot extension varies. And way back in the day, back in 2000, when you first got your domain name, you were looking at something that, um, that wasn't dot gov, that, hey, I've got this domain name. I want it to, to sound like myrtlebeach.org or .com, and it's name recognition for your tourists. Well, fast forward to today, and we do have what's called dot gov. And there are some counties and some local government entities that are using it. And the um, CISA, which is the uh, National Security Association under Department of Homeland Security, as well as GSA, General Services Administration, um, are really pushing for government entities to transition to a .gov domain. 
And uh, I know I've talked to a number of counties that have done it, and some have said it was very easy. Others have said that you know we didn't want to give up our local name and we were concerned about having to change over to something longer. Uh, GSA has been very good to work with and accommodate. And so why do you jump to .gov? They are the, the it's trusted. When I as a citizen log into a county website or access a county website and it says .gov, I know that it's that that domain has gone through a little bit more rigid process to ensure security. And what I mean by that is that I know it's going to be HTTPS and it's authoritative. It tells me that this is one that is managed at that highest level, the domain name by a government entity. And it's secure. As I said, the HTTPS, uh, what they're working on now is to ensure that it, it's secure from the top layer all the way down to the subdomains. So it's a good best practice and it's something that I would encourage you if you haven't taken a look at to start looking at because the uh, guidelines are changing. Come September uh, 1st, I'll talk about it in just a second, um, why switching the registration process uh, does show that stronger due diligence and trusted or, and authoritative. Um, and as I said, there are some challenges here for marketing materials and name recognition and the longer domain name, but staff at GSA have assured us that they will work with the county to try and keep that name recognition. Uh, so there are challenges, but ways to work around that. Now to what's changing. Apologize, I, I jumped ahead a few slides there. Come September 1st, a preload process will be in effect. And what that means is that in order to get, that, get a .gov after September 1st, you're gonna have to pass certain validations. So not only is your, your domain name, I'll just say you know, adamscountypa.gov will have to have HTTPS, but any subdomains will have to meet that requirement as well. And if you have a .gov right now, you can go to the, the website I have listed there and you can um, click on the, uh, the preload link and put your .gov name in there and it'll tell you if you pass the preload requirements. They're not gonna cut anybody's uh, domain off. Uh, they are gonna allow a number of years for even existing .gov to ensure that their subdomains are in order and have HTTPS. So I just wanted to cover that um, in this presentation, in terms of elections, it will give an added, added layer of transparency and authoritativeness and security that citizens are looking for. It's not something you're going to have set up in time for the fall election, but there's no reason why you can't start the process. And if there's any questions, please feel free you know, to, to put those in the, the question um, box. I know Derek is monitoring that for us today. <clears throat> so now just in uh, the last few slides, I want to just talk about some things that NACO is doing from technology and, and cyber specifically, three areas that I want to cover, tech exchange, uh, some training with Professional Development Academy, and the Cybersecurity Collaborative. As I said at the beginning, if you're um, not a member of the NACO County Tech Exchange, uh, you'll get my email information at the end. Please email me and we will add you. Uh, you get access to this portal of resources, but you also get access to a discussion group. Right now we have over 460 members. Uh, it just started in February and we're growing every day and it is for county IT professionals. Uh, you get access to interaction with other county IT directors and CIOs and CISOs sharing questions. I, I see daily questions being posted and one county from the western side of the United States answering somebody on the eastern side. Uh, great information that was shared even yesterday asking about hiring practices and what to look for with IT help desk, for example. A great source, as I said, of, of uh, peer networking there. We also have a portal that gives you access to technology policies, job descriptions. We're building the request for proposal area. 
and then best practices as well as toolkits. Uh, telework is there and it'd be a great resource for you if you have the, the opportunity to visit the portal. We do monthly IT, IT newsletters. We are doing three, at least three webinars a month because we get approached by federal agencies and national agencies and of course our partner community to share information to um, county IT directors and CIOs. So with this situation we're in right now with COVID, those webinars are a little bit more frequent than normal. And then you're able to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at, every so often we will do a survey gathering some feedback from you all as the IT experts at the county level, which helps us at NACO present the needs to a, a legislative um, body as well as to other entities that we work with to help improve the county IT posture. And this is just a quick slide of what the portal looks like. Let me just talk now about one new program called the Cybersecurity Collaborative. Uh, it is a fee-based program uh, that county IT directors and CIOs can access at a reduced rate and can interact with the, the Fortune 500 side of, of our partners. Uh, very uh, robust connections and uh, folks that you can talk to on any given day uh, if you have a problem or a concern around security specifically. And there's a daily uh, alert that goes out. There's an online community where you can access some additional resources. And then they, they as well have live webinars and demonstrations, but also opportunity to be part of what are called SWAT teams to help develop new toolkits and best practice documents. And then finally, we can't go anywhere or very, we're very limited in our travels these days when it comes to training. And the uh, uh, High Performance Leadership Academy is a partner with uh, NACO and they've been providing leadership training for your elected officials, but they also have a cybersecurity leadership academy. And I've gone through it. I've gone through both the cybersecurity and the high performance leadership academies. Excellent, excellent uh, interaction over a 12 week time period. Some homework required, but we also do what are called um, tabletops and you get to dialogue with other CIOs, IT directors, and CISOs across the United States in a smaller cohort. Uh, so I highly encourage you to take a look at that. And if you go to the NACO website, you can get that information. And there are scholarships available to counties. If your county hasn't sent someone through the program, uh, then there's at least one scholarship available that can be used. Now, in closing, I just want to talk a little bit about some national resources. If nothing else from today uh, and that you're not a member of, you really need to take a look at the Center for Internet Security, specifically MSISAC and EIISAC, Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center and the Elections Information um, Sharing and Analysis Center. I uh, joined under my former role at the, the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania and NACO is now a member as well. Those alerts that we get throughout the day about vulnerabilities or emerging threats are so vital and there are other services that they provide. A weekly list of IP addresses that you should be blocking uh, as well as um, uh, vulnerability scanning that they will do for free on your external facing websites. Great source of, of resources there. There are um, some that they charge for, but there's quite a few that are free. And separate from, but working very closely with the Center for Internet Security is Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They do an annual online um, survey tool that you can work through, great results that help you prioritize what you need to focus on for the coming year, as well as some other tools such as um, their Einstein data trends. So these are free ones that are listed, but they, they again have some monitoring tools that they
provide. One is called the Albert sensors uh, that help you monitor your environment. And all of this that I've described and explained helps strengthen your security when it comes to election support. So I don't want you to forget about that. Good common sense, best practices, but then specific opportunities for you to engage in at the national level uh, to improve your, your cyber defenses for elections. And then the last one there is their virtual training environment. Uh, this is where you need a .gov or you have to get an exception. Uh, the Fed VTE, the virtual training environment, wealth of training um, opportunities there that are very technical in nature. So think about uh, monitoring tools and some other types of training uh, that you may pay quite a bit for. You could conceivably get through the Fed VTE program. And then some general training as well from uh, cybersecurity at a high level and then delving even deeper. So again, these are links I highly encourage you to take a look at for national resources that are a given in my book. These should not be an exception. They should be the rule as you manage and oversee your IT responsibilities. So coming up just quickly here, uh, the NACO Tech Exchange is sponsoring some webinars and one is next week, elections and ransomware. And Derek, I'll make sure that I send you the link to that, um, but I really uh, encourage you to uh, tune into that because you will hear from representatives at CISA and EIISAC, a specific, uh, even more in depth than what I've talked about today when it comes to elections. And then two other uh, webinars, July 29th, data governance. Uh, that date might move by a day. Um, and then in August, we have one uh, that AT&T pre is presenting uh, about FirstNet and some exciting things they've been doing during COVID. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Derek, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and I'll leave this slide up so that you all have access to email addresses. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Rita. I, we appreciate you taking the time uh, with us today. Again, um, if you do have a question, now is the time to pose it. We only have a few minutes left in our designated hour, but we can field a couple of questions if any member of the audience does have that. Um, just real quick, I'll ask one while we're waiting on others to ask. Rita, if you were a county IT director or IT staffer, and you needed um, you needed like a two sentence pitch to a county administrator or county or a county board chair to make the conversion to .gov. Uh, what would you what would you recommend? Two sentences or less. Great question. Yeah. All righty. Um, in the day and age that we're in, our citizens need to know that we are providing access to resources on our website in the most secure fashion possible. .gov gives us that over .com or .us or .org. .gov goes through a, a more rigid process to ensure that we're following security best practices. All right, great. Um, once again, if anybody does have a question, now is the time. Uh, just some reminders. Uh, the video from today's session, will, a link will be posted on the Camp Counties page, uh, as will a link to Rita's slide deck. I thought there were a lot of good practical tips within that, so it would be good to uh, encourage your colleagues to access uh, the video and the slide deck, because um, this issue certainly isn't going to be going away, and if anything, we'll just begin to consume more and more of our policymaking time. Um, still don't see any questions, so um well, let me hang on just a second here nope okay yep that, that didn't come through as a question but um i'm gonna wind things up today just again i want to thank rita and naco for all their support of us here at in michigan and at mac uh second again remember to visit the camp counties page uh, for 24 7 viewing of today's video and any of the other camp counties webinars also, please remember to visit our website to register for our upcoming virtual annual conference, August 18th through the 27th. 
Again, August 18th through the 27th, we will be virtual with our annual conference, but you do need to register for that. And there is a registration deadline uh, in early August. So uh, it's best to go ahead and get registered as quickly as possible. And with that, I'm gonna close it out today. Again, thank you, Rita. Thank you everybody who attended and be safe. Thank you, take care.